I think that there is a long-standing left idea that yes, Hamas is pursuing ends other than our own, but what they're doing can be made to serve our ends somehow. That would be the best version of leftism, right? The worst version, of course, is that somehow there's something inherently just in the Hamas attack, in and of itself, right. regardless of where it leads. There we go. So welcome again to the Catrone Zone with uh, the last Marxist, Chris Catrone, the only Marxist, according to uh, Fakhri El Sawadi, I think is how you say his name, um, who was just recently, yesterday, no, Monday, on the Sublation Magazine stream uh, uh, to talk about the attacks um, from by Hamas on Israel. Um, and... Chris, uh, we're going to break from our usual routine of talking of maybe theoretically and, you know, starting from your own writings. And I just want to talk to you about the current moment in politics. Um, and I guess to start with, I'll just point out that uh, even though I don't think the opinion that I'm seeing online from the majority of the leftists in my milieu reflect any kind of overall general consensus, if I didn't know that, I would think that the majority of people are very uh, enthusiastic about Hamas and um, are perhaps even a little bit bloodthirsty when it comes to Israelis. Um, yes. Um, so first of all, I guess, you know, I'll fulfill my um, my bad reputation as some kind of a leftist troll and say, happy Columbus Day. Related. Um, so, yeah, I mean, huh, this is one of the things that I'm notorious for, Israel-Palestine. And through a kind of maliciously hate-quoted, taken-out-of-context statement from the internal listserv of Platypus that came like 100 emails into some discussion and in which I was trying to address many different things at once. And I think Fakhri mentioned it, Right. Um, uh, because this is something that's been circulated. And so uh, usually, though, the end of that email is not quoted, right? So it is, it's posted somewhere and it's quoted in full, but then it circulates and people plant it on, there probably is just one loser who, who goes and plants it on every video of ours on YouTube. Yeah, it's it's just like, you know, it's the quotation of like, you know, okay, this is for internal consumption, blah, 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 and the rational kernel of racism and this kind of thing. And so, but they don't get to the end. And I feel like maybe Fakhri himself had not seen the end, which is, I say, Israel-Palestine is an example of the failures of the 20th century, right? He, no, he did. So he said, I disagree with Chris Catron that the path to liberation has to go through the state of Israel. And, you know, I would I would agree with that, of course, because the state of Israel, what the hell is that? Because he says, you know, uh, Israel is a corrupt third world Bonapartist state, and it's as much a failure as any other third world developmental state, you know, that only conjuncturally enjoys, you know, the kind of, uh, you know, uh, position that it has. Um, but, you know, but is clearly a kind of political failure, and that, of course, the plight of the Palestinians is a demonstration of that. Like, why can't Israel integrate the Palestinians? That is a mark of failure of Israel as a state. Um, they don't get to that part. That, in other words, the punchline in my email was, you know, this whole conflict is is an example of that. And also, I would say, you know, and this is this is something that I've been saying for a very long time, but it's also something taken up by other people on the left. Um, occasionally, which is, you know, the world that we live in is the product of World War I and the aftermath of World War I and the failure of World Socialist Revolution after World War I. And Israel-Palestine, you know, the Balfour Declaration, right, is a, is a direct, like, you know, the, the collapse of the Ottoman Empire, the imposition of these um, kind of neo-colonial protectorates by Britain and France as part of the Versailles Peace you know, as part of the Wilsonian League of Nations kind of project, but also not really a good example of the Wilsonian vision 
of the piece, right? Um, so, you know, the piece after World War One that sets the world up for more war, actually, and not just World War Two, but all the post-colonial wars. And Israel-Palestine is a clear example of that, right? Of, you know, here's a kind of open festering wound of history. And again, how we see that history. If we see it as, well, it's a racist settler, colonial state and Zionist, Zionist entity I read somewhere. Some, someone dusted off this old 70s language of the Zionist entity. And I immediately flashed on the Symbionese Liberation Army, like we will crush the fascist insects, you know, the Zionist entity, the fascist insects, like all this kind of post new left madness of the sevens. We seem to be there, Doug. But in a way, we've always been there on the issue of Israel Palestine, haven't we? At least since 67, at least since, you know, the annexation of the occupied territories or whatever you want to call it, the occupied, the acquisition of the occupied territories, I guess they were never like annexed exactly. Um, but, you know, the Israeli victory in 67 has set the stage, right? And so it is this kind of very overwrought issue that's difficult to reconnect to the issue of capitalism, right? Like on the face of it, it seems like to bring up capitalism and the struggle for socialism is to somehow avoid the issue, is to somehow dodge the issue entirely. Because what about the suffering of the Palestinians, right? And, you know, it's, it, but you could say that about everything. You could say that about police brutality in the United States. Like there, you know, pretty much anything and everything is a huge leap to the question of capitalism and the struggle for socialism. With the rare exception in 2008 of the economic or financial crisis. But again, how the economic crisis played out politically, like in the political realm, how did it play out? So with Black Lives Matter, you know, it's the loss well, of public assets. Anti, uh, Anti-austerity movements first, right? And then and then um, um, calls to nationalize the banks and to return to the New Deal and Fordism and and uh, and Keynesianism, but let's but let's not talk about that. What I what I what I want to point out is, um, to me, and you tell me if this is wrong. It, to me, it seems like I am asked to consider two things in this moment, which are not disconnected, but aren't directly connected, are not the same thing. One is, what is wrong with the American left? Um, it's a question I'm always asking, but to, I'm asking it anew. And two people. Yesterday came to me, friends of mine, people who I've worked with um, on this kind of project in the past, and I won't say their names, came to me and said, listen, I'm done with the left. I'm leaving the left. I, I think I've heard from the same people. Yeah, um, right. And, and I and, feel like uh, I've always felt this way about the left's response to this issue. I've always felt, I mean, I think the way I put it is, we think we're talking about one thing, capitalism and socialism and Marxism and a left and then you realize in the face of this kind of a phenomenon that actually people are talking about something entirely different right in other words they're not interested in what we're interested in and of course that's the basic point of the left being dead the question still remains like how is it possible that so quickly people who are calling themselves socialists embraced Hamas in this moment um, and how uncritically people seem to embrace Hamas and insist upon as a, as a, uh, the, the, not the, the protection of the Palestinians, not a rejection of the Israeli response, not, not, you know, a, a, a call for um, uh, uh, some alternative to massive bombing campaigns in Gaza. Nothing like those were not the talking points. The talking points were go Hamas, basically, for the first day from my little tiny milieu. You know, there's not most, most people. So that's the first thing. The question I have to ask is why is uh, an embrace of Hamas becoming uh, obligatory. A tribal, yeah, obligatory? Uh, well, it goes test. back a way now, right? So I feel like in the entire period of platypus, 
Right. So there are a couple of things that I want to say. So one is, you know, you brought this up with Fakri, but um, and it came up with uh, Helen Rollins as well. With the Northern Ireland example, which is the post-Cold War settlement of issues that were not, you know, due to the Cold War, but certainly fed fed by the Cold War. So apartheid, South Africa, Northern Ireland and Israel, Palestine. Because these were conflicts that were actually proxy conflicts in the Cold War. Right. So the IRA, you know, the provisional IRA, you know, they were not communists necessarily. Right. But they, you know, were funded, trained, supplied by the East, by the Warsaw Pact. They were fostered. Right. The the East did foster terrorism. They did. The Soviet bloc did foster terrorism. Um, And, you know, so... As did the West as well. well, I mean, right? Okay, so maybe this, you know, I'm such a leftist that, of course, it goes without saying. (laughs) I know, I know, but I just want to... West supports fascists and everything else, right? You just have to... Right now, I feel like we have to say that. Otherwise, we're going to come off to some people like we're defending the West or something, but... but No, 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 right. So, but, okay, so I guess that brings up the other thing that is circulating around. Um, which is, you know, Hamas was not started by Israel, but it was supported by Israel against the PLO, right? So, you know, and again, the PLO would have been the Soviet bloc client. So I don't want to disrupt the, the where you were going, because what in the conversation with, about, with Helen Rollins about Northern Ireland, my point was that my understanding was that the peace dividend after the end of the Cold War allowed for some internal investment, including in Ireland and Northern Ireland, which might have helped along the the creating conditions that could help bring a peaceful accord. Well, look, the Palestinians have been funded by the international community, by the EU, by the United States, by the UN. They have. Right. It's but not, not for lack, but, it's but, not for but lack through of aid. But through aid, you know, like subsistence funding. Well, that's what Helen was saying about Northern Ireland that it is subsidized in a way that no other part of the United Kingdom is. Right, but the, but there's different kinds of subsidies. There's subsidies where you bring in food and and basics to people and that are that is No, more general more general financial subsidies, but, right. Yeah, but there this was a kind of subsidies that helped develop tech production in in Well, right. Ireland. So it's okay. So let's 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 back it up a bit. So I don't want to make it into just economics, right? So I'm not I'm not trying to say that either, but the cold but this gets it back to the cold war cuz that uh-huh. I said the dividend, you know, the the peace dividend after the cold war had an impact, but then the other side of that would be the politics changed at the same time, right? Oh, well, right. And so the thing is if you look at Hamas and when is Hamas's real opportunity? It's in the failure of the peace process. Right. And mm-hmm. so it's the failure of Oslo and Oslo II. And it's also, you know, the first and second intifadas. Right. And so really, though, it's a it's a kind of a late phenomenon, Hamas. Uh, and Hamas coming to power in Gaza. And so it's really bound up you know, fundamentally with, we could see the failure of Arab nationalism. It's bound up with the failure. I mean, really Islamism generally in the Middle East is a phenomenon of the failure of Arab nationalism. That's why it flourishes really starting in the seventies, you know, and that's why you have the Iranian revolution um, because there's a crisis of the developmental state and the political regime of the developmental state in the Arab world is nationalism. So the failure of that nationalism then gives rise to Islamism politically. Just be clear, what's the, the developmental state is what particularly as opposed to other kinds of states? What, what well, is the, the post-colonial state? state, the idea of uh, you know, building up a national economy um, building up like, you know, national autonomy at an economic level. So, you know, uh, seemingly the opposite of globalization. Right. Right. So not, not if there's foreign investment, it's not investment in for private entities in 
in the no, there states, were but... there were but there's a large public nationalized sector right right and so you know uh, you know you could say that the last arab nationalist states in classic form um although of course quite still affected by the the history we're discussing the neoliberal era would be but the Bathist Iraq and Bathist Syria, right? Um, Egypt had gone through a change, um, you know, in the neoliberal era. I mean, it had been, you know, a kind of a center, you know, Nasserism had been kind of prototypical uh, for Arab nationalism. And, you know, Gaddafi's Libya was also some kind of a holdout, right? But there is this idea that like the West is knocking out all the, you know, Arab but, nationalism. But this was bef before neoliberalism fully took hold, though. You're saying that the developmental states in the Middle were East in were, were in crisis. Were in and, crisis. And and the and what caused those developmental states? Oh, the global to be downturn. The global downturn affects you know. So when we think about things like the Great Recession or like the global downturn, we do think of the metropolitan world. But what you have to understand is that as, as hard as it hits the metropolitan world, it hits the rest of the world a lot harder, right? And so uh, the Shah of Iran was brought down basically by the collapse of the world economy in the 70s, right? And so, you know, we forget these things. And the left historically had subordinated itself in the Stalinist era had turned itself into a tale of Arab nationalism and had discredited itself accordingly, right? So the, the decline of Arab nationalism also, you know, involved the decline of the socialist communist left, so to speak, although Arab nationalism also played a role in actively suppressing and wiping out the socialist and communist left in the Middle East. And I don't want to like, give too much credence to that because they were Stalinist parties. And so they were kind of not, not exactly what we would be interested in really. Um, and, you know, but generally they, you know, agreed with a kind of third world nationalism mm -hmm. in a way that of but course. So did, so did the United States at that time? Oh, absolutely. I mean Oh, yeah. right. so, of course, the United States has a national developmental. I mean, so here's a, you know, little known fact. The Kennedy administration supported Algerian nationalism against the French. Mm -hmm. Right. Despite the Cold War. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, again, uh, maybe a dicey move, maybe, but not really. You know, Algeria is pretty, pretty solidly in the Western camp. Which is why someone like Peter Dale Scott, this conspiracy, uh, pretty smart conspiracy theorist, once told me years ago, like uh, over a decade ago, that the student worker strikes of May in 1968 were a CIA, CIA plot. Oh, man. Uh, right. Yeah, right. <laughs> well, they might because the well U.S. interests and, you yeah, know, the, because mean, the U.S. interests and French Gaullist interests were not the same. They're not the same. In that, right. They're yeah. still not the same. Right. Right. The EU and, you know, the United States don't have the same interests. I mean, they, of course, from our perspective, they have the same interests. But in terms of capitalism, there's a lot of room. So let's, you know, let's yeah. let's reframe things. So yeah. that's where Hamas comes from. Mm -hmm. Right. And, um, you know, so the current conflict. Right. Because I feel like every few years there is a blow up of Israel-Palestine. Mm -hmm. There's some kind of military conflict. So the issue, I think, analytically, if, if you will, is why the present conflict is happening. So, you know, I also watched, you know, so you also interviewed um, Daniel Ben-Ami, mm -hmm. and he was resistant to a geopolitical analysis mm -hmm. a little bit, and that is like a, a, a very foregrounded, kind of thing now in the in the mainstream media you know people are like well Hamas attacked because it's a proxy of Iran and they're trying to prevent the Saudi Israeli rapprochement right the expansion of the Abraham Accords um yes that's a factor 
right? Like we should not forget that the Saudi Iranian conflict is much greater than the Israeli Palestinian conflict, actually. Mm. Like Iran wants nuclear weapons, Saudi Arabia wants nuclear weapons. Why? For each other. Because of Israel. No, for each other. Not for Israel. No, no, no. (laughs) No, this is the thing. Iran does not want nuclear weapons because of Israel. Iran wants nuclear weapons because of Saudi Arabia. That's right. the actual and, reason. And Saudi Arabia was was asking to receive nuclear weapons yeah. in, if, in exchange for the deal with Israel. And Well, and nuclear Israel. technology, peaceful nuclear technology. Not nuclear weapons, peaceful nuclear technology. But, you know, people talk about the Iranian nukes have to be stopped, otherwise there'll be a nuclear arms race in the Middle East. They don't mean between Israel and Iran. They mean between Saudi Arabia and Iran. Right? And so that's really, you know, because the Yemen war has all been about Saudi versus Iran. Right? Also, the Syrian civil war is Saudi versus Iran. So the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, not so important as people might think. Geopolitically, hardly important at all, actually. And that's the tragedy of the Palestinians. No one cares. No one cares. Right? It's not like the the American left does, and and by the way, the U.S. government does too. Meaning the U.S. government does not want to see the expulsion of the Palestinians. Right? Another, like, little-known fact. The U.S. government is not, like, Zionist in this way, right? Um, No. And, you know, it goes back to, I was um, reminded that George George Herbert Walker Bush, again, right, so he's kind of bridging the post-Cold War era. He made aid to Israel contingent on halting the settlements. And that is the U.S. policy, by the way. In other words, the U.S. does, like the rest of the world, consider the settlements to be illegal. And no U.S. money can go to the settlements, right? Nominally, they can't, it can't, right? So they're against the settlements, right? And, of course, the U.S., you know, any peace deal, you know, land for peace, right? What does land for peace mean? It means Israel giving up the settlements, right? So, like, the U.S. position, I mean, because this is the other thing about the left, and, you know, we get lost in the rhetoric, I think, and, you know, the negotiating positions, right? I was just reading um, with the Platypus Kids, um, Hegel's Introduction to the Philosophy of History, and it starts off with a discussion of, like, you know, writers, historians of the past, but really chroniclers, original history, and, you know, Julius Caesar, and he's like, military transactions, That's the phrase he uses, military transactions. So what we're seeing is a military transaction. Meaning this is negotiating with, you know, bombs and bullets and slit throats and, you know. Um, This is ultimately a negotiation. That's what it is. So the idea that, you know, history will judge Hamas correct Because in the future, the Palestinians will be free, and then this will be seen as a heroic uprising like the Warsaw Ghetto or the Nat Turner Rebellion. No, that's not going to be the future. Like, the future is not going to look back and say, um, you know, that this was a heroic uprising of the Palestinian people. No. How can you tell the difference? Between the, you know, the, the the uprising from the Warsaw Ghetto and this, what 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 makes it different? Chris? Well, the Allies won, and the Allies were always going to win. And if the Nazis had won, then the Warsaw Ghetto would not be a heroic, heroic uprising, would it? No, I guess not. Right. I and mean, so, I mean, maybe for have... maybe underground it would be, you know, as uh, the struggle continued. If the Nazis won. Yeah. You know, and the, the the dissidents would go underground, and we would secretly talk about that one time, and or know. it would just be suppressed; it'd be erased from the historical record. I mean, you know, we do we are living in an Orwellian world, and so, you know, again, it's kind of like, how do we think about this? And I think that Israel's going to win, 
Of course, it's always going to win. It's not going to lose. It's just not going to lose. That's never going to happen. Right? This Whatever fantasy people might have that all the Jews in Israel are going to move to the United States. No. They're not. No, gonna, yeah. Right? That's the right. fantasy. It's just not, that is not going to happen. We can be sure of that. Mm-hmm. Now, what it does mean is that somehow the Israelis and the Palestinians are going to have to learn to live together. Mm-hmm. Right? You know, the French and the Germans have learned to live together. Despite World War I and World War II, despite the Franco-Prussian War, despite the Napoleonic Wars. Well, I want to Protestants live together in Europe despite hundreds of years of religious warfare in the Protestant Reformation. So yeah, I totally, I, I totally agree with you. But you know, Fakhri said something that was important that maybe will help underline your point, which is that th- there's a an ideology of defeatism that needs to be overcome. So let's talk about that. So the idea is that you embarrass Benjamin Netanyahu and you bring down his government. That's what we're talking about. We're not talking about defeatism like it's going to go to socialist revolution or even any kind of just capitalist democratic revolution. No, the real issue is Netanyahu. I mean, so the calculus of Hamas, right? So let's put ourselves in the position of Hamas for a second. And like I said, um, you know, things are going on. The Saudi-Israeli rapprochement is going on. Uh, There was some kind of a disturbance in the West Bank also not that long ago, um, where Israeli troops were already being deployed, um, you know, for security reasons. Um, And there's the 50th anniversary of the Yom Kippur War, like to the day, to like the religious holiday, like not to the date in the Western calendar, but the Jewish calendar. I think that the attack was on the date, the 50th anniversary of the Yom Kippur War. And so, you know, clearly it was planned. Clearly this attack was going to happen one way or another. Um, And so what is Hamas trying to achieve? Right? It can't defeat Israel militarily. So what can it do? Right? And that's where the Saudi connection comes in because it's like a public relations stunt, essentially. In other words, it's meant to embarrass the Saudis and make it more difficult for them to have a rapprochement with Israel. It is meant to embarrass the Benjamin Netanyahu government, which is a particularly right-wing government, that because of these fragile coalitions, right, the parliamentary coalitions and the Neset in in Israel, he has had to give ministerial positions to crazy right-wing Zionist, you know, people who are to the to his right, right? And so, you know, again, it's a military transaction. It's also a terror attack. It is terrorism. And I do want to talk about that because, you know, I am, I am Lenin, you know, I'm Spartacus, I am Lenin. And so I do want to talk about that. It's a terrorist attack, um, clearly. Uh, you know, what's interesting is that the music festival that was attacked where people were slaughtered was a peace festival, meaning these are people who hate Netanyahu. These are Israelis who are politically opposed to Netanyahu and Hamas knows that. And so killing them is like, you know, yeah, you might be opposed to Netanyahu, but that won't spare you, right? So it's a pressure tactic, right? Terrorism is a pressure tactic. That's what it is. It's a violent pressure tactic and you do spectacular atrocities and you film them on your cell phone and you broadcast them to the world and you pretend to be proud and you know that the guys who are doing this stuff are jacked up on drugs, right? You know that Hamas gives the fighters drugs to, you know, rape and kill people, right? So it's no different from, like, I don't know, your kind of African Civil War or whatever, child soldiers, you know, it's these things, you know. So, you know, they unleash these, you know, lumpen, lumpen people, lumpen proletarian people, and they, you know, fill them with drugs and they unleash them. And, you know, but it is nonetheless a calculated attack, right? And it is it is meant to raise this specter, right? So you would think, okay, well, there's this wall, there's this, you know, militarized border, 
And so why is it there? Because the Israelis are afraid of the Palestinians. And then you do something that shows exactly what they have to be afraid of. Like, yes, the Palestinians will kill you in your bed as you sleep. They will rape your children and, right, they, they will do these things. Uh, the first breach in the security, this is what will happen. All these Palestinians are waiting to come and do this, right? But, you know, the Hamas leadership in Qatar, you know, sitting safely in the distance, it's all calculated. It's politics. And that's where I would want to keep the focus. I would want to keep the focus on not on the humanitarian plight of the Palestinians, nor the atrocities of Hamas, nor the perfidy of the Zionist entity of, you know, the Israeli government, nor of the collusion of the United States, right? I mean, the United States, you know, can be critical of Israel. And it's not a wag the dog situation where Israel controls U.S. policy. It doesn't. It absolutely does not. Um, nor does the U.S. control Israeli policy. So it's politics. You know, famously, Obama and Netanyahu didn't like each other. And so maybe Biden inherits that. So, you know, the Hamas people are thinking about this. They are thinking about the Democratic Party. They're thinking about the squad. They're thinking about Biden. They're thinking about Obama. They're thinking about Netanyahu. They're thinking, there's a little weakness here that we can push on, right? Not to collapse U.S.-Israeli relations, but just maybe get rid of Netanyahu. Maybe. Maybe make his government fall, maybe. And maybe replace it with an even more right-wing government which also suits them because again, it is. Why would they want to do that? Why would they want to get rid of Netanyahu? If a right-wing government suits them, why would they want a more right-wing government or would oh, they rather a have right a more right-wing wrong? government? A more right-wing government would be even more unstable. Hmm. Right. And so again, it's, it's, we need to understand, first of all, does Hamas really want to just, wipe out all the Jews in Israel or push them all out and make them go back to... Uh... That's their ostensible ideology. Yeah. And yes, I guess they want that. But there's a question of what they want and what they want, meaning the role that they're playing historically. This is the role of Hamas. Hamas is the, like, off-the-chain attack dog to Abbas and the Palestinian National Authority. So... They oppose each other very violently, by the way. So when Hamas took over Gaza, the first thing they did was execute all the PLO people, all the Fatah, all the Palestinian Authority people. They literally took all the police, all the bureaucrats, lined them up and machine gunned them. But they cooperate too. Meaning Hamas attacking is a pressure tactic for Abbas to use vis-a-vis -vis Israel. Right. So, you know, again, like Fakhri was talking about, we need to take a cold historical view. Yeah, we need to take a cold historical view, not from the standpoint of like millennia, but we need also need to take a cold political view of like what's going on now and what the actors are really about. So, yes, nominally, sure. Of course, Hamas would love it if they could scare all the people in Israel to relocate to Europe and the United States. But realistically, no, that's not going to happen. Or even if it does happen, ha what's the process by which that's going to happen? Right? How do you unfold that over decades or something? Right? Because they're in it for the long haul. And, but, you know, the role that they might play, I mean, this is why, like, Norman Finkelstein will say, it's like the Nat Turner Rebellion or something, right? So obviously, like, you know, the role of the Nat Turner Rebellion was to make the slavocracy in the U.S. more rigid, which then set up the Civil War, which abolished slavery. Right? So it's, you know, I mentioned Hegel, a dialectical process. <laughs> right? And, you know, I think that thinking people on the left at some level understand that this is pressure tactics, it's negotiating positions, that's what it is. And it's public relations. It's media spectacle, right? It's demoralize, demoralize your enemy, right? How do you get them to the negotiating table? Like that's when Norman Finkelstein says wipes the smile off Israel's face. Ultimately, what does that mean? It means you bring Israel to the negotiating table. That's what it means, right? That's all that it could mean. 
right? And how do you do so? And who, you know, what kind of seat at the table? Who has what kind of seat at the table? So the thing is, Hamas does not have a seat at the table. Abbas does. Nonetheless, Hamas plays a role in, in the peace process without having a seat at the table. But what I was going to say is, don't think that there isn't back-channel communication between Israel and Hamas. Of course there is, just as there is between Israel and Iran. So again, people on the left think, oh, you know, these are just deadly enemies who would, like, kill each other at the first chance. At one level, sure. At another level, of course, they're dealing with each other. So what is Netanyahu's ultimate aim? I mean, I think the way most people on the left in the United States would think is that Netanyahu's real aim and the Israeli aim over, overall is simply to uh, um, uh, maybe not genocidally murder all of the Palestinians, but to wipe out their sovereignty altogether, to create an, a, a kind of a permanent apartheid condition. Right. Well, eh, yeah, maybe. I mean, Bantu stands, sure. I mean, you, I would, you get these maps, you know, where you show yes. the, the way Palestine has been shrinking and shrinking. And the idea right. is eventually there will be no land left for Palestine. Um, and that is what the, the Israeli aim is, ultimately. Yeah, I guess so. I mean, but also, what does that mean? I mean, back in the day, people talked about the population bomb. You know, in other words, that ultimately the Palestinians will reproduce faster than the Israelis. And so they will outnumber them. And, you know, there's even that prospect potentially within Israel itself of the Israeli Arab population, which people forget about. And, of course, I, I would be remiss to fail to mention that there are non-Jewish Israelis who are ardent supporters of Israel. The Druze, the Bedouins, right? There are non-Jewish, whether religiously or racially, who are among the most ardent supporters of Israel against Muslims and Arabs, right? So don't forget that. Um, and, you know, so it's it's one of these things where I kind of feel like, you know, here, what are no, we- No, I'm just asking about the ideology of Benjamin Netanyahu. Oh, what Benjamin is the, Netanyahu. Well, and, or, or of Israel, or of the Israeli project. Um, when, the, the Israel that is continuing- to encourage the settlers and to to well look okay Zionism right a Jewish state mm -hmm. right what does a Jewish state mean it means you know it doesn't mean a state where non Jews can't live it does mean a state with a Jewish identity and what does that mean right that's like saying France has a French identity do you know it's like in other words. The United States does not have like an Anglo identity. I hate to tell people the United States doesn't have a Christian identity or an Anglo identity. Those are like fringe ideologies, right? If everybody in the United States was Muslim and spoke Chinese and we had the constitution, it would still be the United States, right? No other country is like that. Get ready for that. No other country is like that. So they are blood and soil nation states and Israel is one. And that's Zionism, right? So mm -hmm. then the question is, well, what does the Jewish identity of Israel as a nation state amount to, right? Does it amount to discrimination? Does it amount to racism? Well, it might, right? It might very well. But the question is, again, then you'd have to get into the details of that, right? How are Israeli Arabs discriminated against? You know, there are. Arab-Israeli parties in the Neset, in the parliament. They are there. Um, and, you know, again, bring into the political realm. And then the question is, well, what about right of return? So sometimes people will talk about that. In other words, any peace settlement, will Israel allow Arabs whose families lived within what is now Israel are allowed to move back and live in Israel or not? right of return. And again, it comes down to like demographics and voting. It comes down to voting. Like Israel's a liberal democracy. I mean, yes, Fakhri is right. It's a corrupt capitalist Bonapartist state. Of course it is. And much more so than the United States is actually. Mm -hmm. Right. Because of its ethnic, because it has the aim of being. And not because state. of that, 
It's no? because it's a third world country. Fakri was right about that too. Okay. Right. Um, I was reminded of Hannah well, Arendt. and by third world, you yeah. don't mean, um, out, uh, you know, uh, non-aligned with either the Soviet Union. Well, or but check United it States. out. It was. This is what people don't remember. But that's In, not what you're talking about when you say I'm not, the no, reason, no, 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 right? No. I mean, you're like saying third world, like underdeveloped, not not productive. A enough. post-colonial state. Yeah. A developmental state project. A post-colonial right. developmental state. Does, project. It's not industrialized enough. It doesn't have enough uh, well, jobs from workers. It is, but the way it fits into the global economy is a little bit different than the metropolitan countries. So you know, think of like, I don't know, Singapore. Right, because that was the other insanity that people were bringing up. It's like, well, Gaza could be Singapore, but instead, it's this like Islamist, you know, hellhole. Gaza is not some, you know, master settler colonialist racial genocidal plan. It is Hamas, right? In other words, it's Israel is basically saying this is pressure on Hamas. You know, the same way the post-Gulf War U.S. sanctions against Iraq were directed at the Saddam Hussein. It's, it's, so I, I, I just want to keep it focused on the politics of it. And, you know, and again, um, let's not forget that. Because I think the sentimental, the heartstrings, the bleeding heart, right, is going to be about, like, first of all, first of all, Israelis are seen as white. They're not. Right. right. There are a lot of Sephardic Jews in Israel. And again, the Jews from the Middle East, and, you know, they're white, basically. But, and, you know, in other words, they're not black. They're not like black Africans. They're not, you know, but they are, you know, they're, they're not Ashkenazi Jews. And they are the right wing people in Israel. They are right wing. They're, again, the most ardent supporters of the Zionist state. And of course, the um, the other point that we should raise that um, in terms of the post Cold War situation, Palestinian labor in Israel was replaced by Eastern uh, by Soviet a Jewish uh, immigration. So Jews left the former Soviet Union. In you know the collapse of the Soviet Union was very harsh, and Jews especially left Russia and other you know Ukraine and other areas. And they went to all sorts of countries, but a lot of them went to Israel. And so that that combined with the closing of the occupied territories as a function of the Intifada contributed to the economic marginalization of the Palestinians. Right. So there was a, you know, Palestinian Arab working class in Israel. No more. A socialist call should be for the loosening of restrictions for Palestinian labor after after this. I mean, I know it's counterintuitive. No, no, no. I mean, of course, the question is, why is it restricted? It's restricted to prevent terrorists from crossing into Israel and doing suicide bombers because you know, there's two intifadas. The first intifada is rock throwing and boycotting of um, settlements, the economic boycott of settlements and rock throwing. The second intifada is suicide bombers. And really that's the phase that we've been in, right? And that's that's what brought about the closure of the border and the building of the walls, etc., right? And you know, so again, the question is, well why did they turn to suicide bombing? You know, because the official narrative such as it is is that the Palestinians broke the Oslo Accords, right? And then the question is, well, why? And how did that happen? And, you know, basically was Yasser Arafat able to contain Palestinian militancy? Or if he didn't go along with the militants, would he himself have been eliminated, right? Um, And, you know, so there's politics. I mean, even Hamas... There's ISIS in Gaza, too, that opposes Hamas. And so there's a question of, well, if Hamas doesn't do this stuff, ISIS will do it. Right? In other words, you know, how, how does Hamas maintain its position? Right? There's internal politics to the Palestinians. That's the basic point. And just as there's internal politics with the Israelis, 
But focusing on the Palestinians for a moment, we could say that the Palestinian people have been the victims of Palestinian politics. The way the the whole point of my last stream was to say, okay, we're not choosing between Hamas and Israel here. The question is, what do we want to create out of this situation? And I guess um, if you're on the left or socialist, what you should be looking for are the forces that might be able to help create conditions for more working people have uh, some way to gain political so power. Here's here's right? Lenin. Here's Lenin on the issue. So first of all, terrorism. So Lenin famously denounced terrorism. His older brother was a terrorist, but that was a different terrorism, right? He did use a nice phrase though, with respect to terrorism, liberals with bombs, meaning yeah. what we're dealing with here. I mean, even though it's like Islamism and you know, and you have all these people running around like Alan Dershowitz or whatever saying Hamas are literally Nazis. And Jews who, who support Hamas's attack are themselves literally Nazis and should be purged from the public and they should never be given a job. And people should understand that under their sweater is a, is a swastika. Some Jewish woman who signed some petition, he's like, she's a Nazi. I'm like, you've lost your fucking mind. But anyway, so, you know, people are losing their mind. Um, and Alan Dershowitz and Norman Finkelstein really lose their minds with each other. Because every time I see Alan Dershowitz now, he's complaining about Finkelstein. Every, like, no matter where he is, he's like, Finkelstein. And I'm like, oh, man. All right. So hopefully boosting sales for sublation. Um, but, uh, you know, but, right, going back to it. So the terrorism that we have now is like your typical right wing capitalist politics terrorism. Meaning terrorism is capitalist politics. That was Lenin's point. And his point was, was calling the liberals with bombs. His point was with respect to things that we would hardly consider terrorism now. Meaning that if Hamas were trying to assassinate Netanyahu, that's very different from killing thousands of Israeli civilians. Right. True, so, but but neither are allowed under international law, and both oh no, are, actually, are allowed, and you know it's yeah. illegal. And no, it's but like, terrorism. but like from from my perspective, when Trump put that put a hit out, um, I forget the, I should know Sul the Suleimani. Yeah, Austin that Suleimani. was that was a terrorist act that and a war crime that it was not. It was, well, it was a terrorist act, anyhow, to assassinate him. It, it was it a was, terrorist act. It was a military act by the United States. It was official state action, right? So terrorists are, by definition, not state actors. Well, so let, let I don't. I, I I know, but that's no. That's actually not how terrorism is defined. It, terrorism. No, no, no. Well, wait. It is a legal definition. So what I'm saying is Lenin opposed that. He opposed like assassination of politically culpable people. Like in other words, like this person definitely guilty of these policies has blood on their hands. Justice demands killing that person. He was against that, Lenin. Not, you know, let alone indiscriminate killing of civilians. Right? So, you know, in other words, like um, they wouldn't they like if if someone killed Netanyahu, they wouldn't call it terrorism. They call it an assassination. That's what they would call it. Um, right. I mean, well, you were saying that, Rabin, that that it counted as a an act Yitzhak of terrorism Rabin, to Lenin. Right. Yitzhak Rabin was killed by a right wing Zionist Israeli for signing the Oslo Accords. Prime Minister of Israel killed. Right. And so that's terrorism in Lenin's language. He opposed that, let alone what we're talking about now. So there's that example. The other example with respect to Lenin is the Easter uprising, right? 
in Ireland during World War I. And there was communitarian, sectarian, civilian violence. There was. And it was ugly. Not a lot of it, but there was some of it. Right? And some of the Bolsheviks, some of the people, you know, the Zimmerwald left, the anti-war Second International Marxists, some of them balked at the Easter Uprising. They were like, yeah, that's not good. The Easter Uprising is not good because of this terrorism. Right? And Lenin said, well... Yes, there are some petty bourgeois outrages being perpetrated. But if you don't have the stomach for that, you'll never support revolution. Now, that's true, right? However, in other words, like there's a far cry from, you know, like Marxists would never have endorsed that kind of action. They would have seen it as counterproductive and bad and criminal even, morally bad, politically bad, but morally bad too. Um, but Right. Again, it's not like that turns like social struggle into a bad thing because this happens. Right. I think that this is where the left is in this slippage realm, especially due to Stalinism. Right. That you end up justifying all sorts of things that can't be justified. Right. But the question is. For me, right. Lenin said that in the context of mass socialist parties, including in Ireland including as a participant in the Easter uprising, right? What we're dealing with now is only what he would have called petty bourgeois outrages, because that's what raping people and killing them in front of their families, that's a petty bourgeois outrage. I hate, to, I hate, it sounds like milk toast. It sounds like, you know, but it, but it is, it is in the political ambit of the PMC. This is the tactics of what we would call the professional managerial class. This is how they get their stuff done. They do this stuff, right? They do gangster type stuff, you know, in other words, right? And so the thing is, you know, so I mentioned Yitzhak Rabin, like, again, like a failed Bonapartist, you know, the capitalist corrupt state. Well, you know, Israel has political assassinations. It does. It like infra in Israeli politics is characterized by this kind of stuff, including like, you know, bombs being set off and also, that, that has happened in the past, too. Israeli on Israeli violence. And, you know, the U.S. obviously has had some of that. It's been a long time. What makes it petty bourgeois exactly? Other than the fact that we know the PMC does it. Why isn't it radical? To, well, it to... is radical, but it's petty no, bourgeois radicalism. Well, it's I mean, not... radical, radical, radical means getting to the root, right? You get to the root of something to make it's a radical rad change. Rhythm. It's rad right. lib. And part of the problem that we're dealing with with Israel Palestine is that it's all rad libism. It's not, none of this is socialism or Marxism. None of it has anything to do with proletarian socialism at all. It's rad libism. Right. 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 When I say radical, though, I mean to get to the root in order to, un, to, to change the foundation. From their of perspective, society. it is radical. In other words, what do they think the bedrock of society is? They think it's national communities. Not capitalism the way we Marxists think about it. Not at all, because capitalism to them is just an economic system imposed by a, a racial privileged group. <laughs> right. That's what they think. <laughs> yeah. No, remember. <laughs> yeah. remember I know, that. but that's, I mean, that is crazy. And any, any so supposed Marxist who would say that is not, you Lost know. the plot. Yeah, yeah totally. But, um. But we're yeah, 100 right. years down the highway of people using Marxism to justify something else. Right. But I mean, I want to point, I just want to underline this. It's like the, the, the reason why it's not radical is because no matter how violent it is, no matter how many, you know, this is pro probably propaganda, you are not actually aiming to change the foundation of society or the relationships between people in society. You're not trying to overcome class relations. And the reason it would be counterproductive is because it it will not or uh facilitate that aim that that doesn't mean that it, it won't that you can't like say when it does happen then now every all bets are off it's too much it, it's like no when it does happen it is counterproductive but perhaps what else is happening you know will be enough to overcome the counterproductive you know counter forces of this petty bourgeois atrocities that are going right, on. Is that, right. is that the way to think of it? That's right. Think? That's right. So it's, 
radical democratic. It can be popular, right? I mean, it still is ultimately, you know, controlled by people. You know, like I said, there is a leadership of Hamas in Qatar that is dictating what is done pretty, pretty minutely, actually dictating what is done um, from the safety of some nice apartment somewhere. Um, but, right, the horizon of politics, right? So when Lenin called terrorism liberalism with guns or liberalism with bombs, he, he, in different writings, he's got different phrases, right? Meaning militant liberalism. What he meant by that was a kind of petty bourgeois democracy, kind of radical liberalism, a radical democracy. And I know that people don't know they think that there's a difference between liberalism and democracy. That's another insanity that people have um, because, you know, a liberalism of course is accepting bourgeois civil society and capitalism, you know, in a way that Marxists show that capitalism undermines bourgeois civil society. And therefore we have some rudiments of it, but it's really under a great deal of siege. So again, the idea being that ultimately you can rearrange the political configuration of capitalism, but without touching capitalism, right? And right. And again, it's going to strike people. And this is why I always harp on, you know, that it's not what the ruling class is doing, right? That's not what capitalism is. Capitalism is not the behavior of the ruling class. Right. No, it's the behavior of the working class, actually. Um, but those be those behaviors are severely constrained. And, so if you and... were to call Hamas like the capitalist misleadership of the Palestinian struggle, people would be like, what the fuck are you talking about? They're not capitalists. Right. And I'm like, you know, all gangsters are capitalists. Yeah. What else are they? Right. You think they don't have bank accounts that they, right. you know, they don't have stock portfolios. The only reason right. not to call them capitalists is because that dignifies them too much. But otherwise, I agree because, you know, the the the, you know, the very obvious um, ideological capitalists, they're not like this. Well, they, they don't have you know, to be. They don't have to right. be. So in other words, you you push them too far, and of course they become this. And of course the the you know the Tony. No, but the, the successful capitalists want to make a deal. They want yeah. to work it out. They want to put money in and get money out. They don't want to. They don't want to blow things up, or they that's want those. What Hamas wants to do too, though. Ultimately, yeah. that's what Hamas wants to do. It's why you know Trump was like, you know, I'll make a deal with the mullahs. I'll make mm -hmm. a deal that they can't refuse, right? <laughs> right? And you know, because he's like, you know, money talks in the end, even to Islamists. Right. And what and what does that mean? That doesn't mean that they're all going to go off on some island and get uh, margaritas and, you know, live in the lap of luxury or with all of uh, the Marcus's shoes or something like that. And you can just bribe them as individuals. No, it's not does about it? that. No, no, no. It's about the political leadership that accepts the on the ground situation. Now, of course, the on-the-ground situation for the Palestinians... So what is the money doing when money talks, is what I'm asking you. when it's If it's not going to their private, their private coffers, it's not a bribe, it's not just a racket for them individually, what is it doing? It's what would money racket. do? That's a general racket. So in other words, when you think about the international aid that goes into the West Bank, right, um, where does it go? What channels does it flow through? Who gets to skim off the top, right? And you know how are how are Palestinians living, right? Well, they're living on you know remittances of relatives who are sending them money, earning money abroad, right? They're some living of them away. are working within Israel. Some of them are some, but you know a lot of the third world, a lot of the post-colonial world now, after fifty years of neoliberalism there's a lot of remittance economies. Like there's a lot of countries that are basically that have very rich kind of kleptocrat ruling class mm -hmm. and very poor. And then what we would call the middle class in the United States, the working class that can earn money living abroad and sending money back to support their families. Mm -hmm. Right. A lot of countries are like that. Philippines. Oh. 
you know, yeah. like a lot of countries are like that. I mean, even North Korea depends a great deal on remittances of North Korean workers working abroad. Right. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it's a, it's ability to earn that kind of money is so limited. When, if Hamas but, were to make a deal with Donald Trump to set, to, to create some sort of peace accord, like, right. What would the, no, I meant what Iran. The, I know, I know, I know you said the mullahs, but I'm yeah. changing it. If Iran has a real political economy in a way that Gaza doesn't. So, right, but this is my point, right? right. Okay, so so when you say that um, Hamas, that, that uh, you know, I, that's why I said to call Hamas capitalist is to dignify them too much because they don't have the ability to make the it deal. Would seem- Right. It would seem that their legitimacy is not based on that. It seems that their legitimacy is entirely based on this whacked out Islamist something or other kind of gang control of the Gaza Strip. Their legitimacy is based upon the continued failure of the Israeli state. Right. That yeah. There's a necessity for there to be no integration. The, 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 the way in which the uh, people of Gaza have been kept out of the labor market. Mm-hmm. The, those terrible conditions is what allows them to persist. But if there was a civilizing effect of work and production in Gaza, if you could make a deal, effect. then they would. The Hamas would at least have to become a mullah. You know, it, they would. It would have. There would be a a, a change in the political character of. of right. Gaza. I mean, Israel obviously has not been able to deal with Hamas. The way they've been able to deal with the Palestinian Authority to some extent, with Fatah, with Mahmoud Abbas, mm-hmm. right? So, um, it, you know, Gaza is this you know peculiar circumstance, um, both with respect to you know. So the the problem with the open air prison idea mm-hmm. is that again, it's like, but why is it an open air prison? It's a prison for who exactly? Is it a prison for Palestinians or is it a prison for Hamas militants? Right, like who are, who are the Israelis trying to keep there? Well, how did Hamas take power in Gaza? Elected. So, I mean... Although there hasn't been an election since. Yeah. But, but you know, um, I, I talked to Gene a while ago about ISIS, right? And, uh-huh. and one of the questions I asked was like, well, where, you know... Where, what what basically what kind of uh, productive economy did ISIS want to set up in the regions where they took power? And it was just it was the answer was basically none. Like there was no and no no one who wanted to make a profit would want to invest in the ter- in the areas that ISIS was where ISIS was running the at show. At that point. At that point. Well, right. So in order and, and as long as ISIS was just going to start just going to go around beheading people for the smallest infraction and create complete conditions of chaos uh, for everyday people and workers, especially there could be no productive investment in an ISIS regime. Right. Conjuncturally. I mean, in other words, again, um, you know, ISIS was a kind of a, a strange phenomenon because it didn't take power within a territorial state. Right. Right. In the way that, the Islamic Revolution took power in Iran or the Taliban took power in Afghanistan, right? And obviously Afghanistan and Iran have international relations and, you know, they deal with capitalists and capitalism all the time. Right. Right. Um, so ISIS, again, it's kind of like, well, what was its goal? But also, all right, so let's think about it a different way, which is who supported ISIS? Yeah, who did? Um, Islamists throughout the world. Um, not Saudi Arabia exactly. I think, but they think that you know. Well, there was Al Qaeda in the Syrian civil war as well, and they were supported by the Saudis and by Israel. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, I don't know if the Turks also supported them. Um, and so you know, again. You know, and they didn't they didn't have like territorial control the way ISIS did. So, you know, again, it's not to say that's why I always resist like the, the kind of economic analysis to start with is that, of course, from an ISIS perspective, if we were ISIS militants trying to establish the caliphate, 
what we'd be trying to establish is a political regime. And then after that political regime is established, then we'll deal with whomever. Right. Right. From a, but from a position of political authority, then we can deal. Right. And so they hadn't quite done that. Um, you know, again, with Hamas and the, well, look, the status of the occupied territories. Right. So I was reading uh, a while ago now, but rereading Jared Kushner's memoir. Mm -hmm. um i think breaking history is the title if i if i don't uh if i if i didn't can i can before we go to jared kushner can i just ask one question real quick okay when you talk about establishing a political authority and then dealing with whoever wouldn't the character of that political authority have a, a, a some impact on who you could deal with and how effectively in other well, that's words exactly where i was going with it Great. Which is okay. to say that nominally the Palestinian Authority has mm. this political legitimacy and Hamas does not. Right. Right. So in the Jared Kushner memoir, he recalls the private discussions between Trump and Mahmoud Abbas, mm -hmm. the leader of the Palestinian Authority. And how Trump got really impatient with him and was like, you know, you're not serious about negotiating. I'm giving you this great deal. Why don't you take it? Right. And again, you know, like what kind of game are you playing? And, you know, you're not going to get a better deal than this. Right. Mm -hmm. And of course, the boss is like, you know, maybe I can get a little bit better deal. Right. And so the fact that he can't control Hamas doesn't mean he can't benefit from Hamas. Mm -hmm. Right. In fact, the fact that he can't control Hamas might put him in a position of being better able to benefit from Hamas's actions because right. he's not responsible for it. And yet it is part of the overall situation. So when you think about international aid to Palestinians, it goes through the Palestinian authority. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and so again, you think about it in terms of Hamas and Fatah, the Palestinian authority, you got to think about, so it's not just Israel, Palestine, it's West Bank, Gaza. And then it's, of course, the international community. Like, you know, why is Hamas located? And in that's Russia? a big abstraction, too. There are so many different players and interests involved in the international community. Right. They might it's each have their own reasons for, for giving the aid. The international to... community right, is an abstraction, but I just want to. Yeah, I know. That in order I just to want say, to complicate it by saying each player would have their own interests in, yes. involved in making that transaction Absolutely. right yeah so hamas is headquartered in qatar but that doesn't by virtue of that fact turn qatar into a um pariah state in the international community the no. way i don't know the taliban regime became a pariah in the international community because al-qaeda was there yeah right theoretically right yeah you know in on right? paper that was why but why was it really well wait well, maybe it wasn't because of that exactly um but the the so, question is, did they control Al-Qaeda or not, the, the, the Taliban? The and Taliban could, did not control uh, Al-Qaeda. Right, that's the, that's the thing. And that's why the U.S. was like, well, you know, you've lost sovereignty. Right. Mm -hmm. So if, if Hamas takes over Qatar, then, of course, Qatar will become a pariah state. But, you know, well, wait, wait, the, but but are you saying Qatar uh, signed off on the attacks from Hamas on no, Israel? But so they can't control going, them either. But, right. But. But why and that's they? what because when you said the Taliban doesn't control Al Qaeda, what we mean is uh, they didn't stop them from attacking not, the United States on 9/11, not committing crimes in the streets. Uh, Nor could they help them arrest, uh, uh, help the U.S. arrest Al Qaeda. So the thing is, Qatar could arrest the Hamas leadership immediately. So why aren't they? Well, because ultimately, even with all the atrocities. Hamas is playing a game that is part of the international system. Like, yes, they're terrorists and look at the atrocities and beheading babies. But at the end of the day, they are part of this mix, right? They're illegitimate, but they're not wholly illegitimate, right? Now, of mm -hmm. course, if they set off a terrorist attack in the United States, which they're not going to do, Hamas, they're never mm -hmm. going to do that. But if they did that, then that would be it. It would, then it would be over. Or if they did attacks in France or England or 
Germany, then that would mm. be the end. Mm. Right? Mm. So again, you know, um, it's about, I mean, look, at the end of the day, so I mentioned, you know, like this is all within the ambit of capitalist politics. Capitalist politics is the realm of bullets and bombs and slit throats. It is. And except when it doesn't need to be. In which right. case, formal, legal, something or other, elections and lawsuits, you know, like, of course, they would kill Trump if they could. But they don't need to. Well, the, not only that, right? the, 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 cost benefit an, the cost benefit analysis works out at the moment for it to be not yeah. worth it to, to, to do that. It. But this is right. why we can't get paranoid about this stuff. Right. Because, mm -hmm. you know, um, we have to understand that. And this is what this is maybe, you know, so again, the left, why the left does this thing. The left are just useful idiots, I guess, of Hamas or something, mm -hmm. you know, and I feel like, you know, if they stopped and thought for a second, mm -hmm. right, they'd realize that this is not what they think it's about. Right. Right. You know, it's, you know, I think that they might have their paranoid fantasies of like, you know, driving the Jews into the sea, you know, which means making them get on jet planes and relocating to the United States. Um, but that's not what this is about. Right. Mm -hmm. And so what is it about? Is it about protesting very loudly? I mean, we've talked about this before. In other words, is killing people just a very, 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 very loud form of protest. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's what it is. It's a right. message. You're sending a message, right? And that's what we usually mean by terrorism, which is like you're striking fear, right? You're sending a message, right? You're saying, you know, I'm very pissed and I'm, I'm willing to do this, you know? Listen, we've been talking for an hour and 15 minutes. I want to talk to you about what terrorism is and how do the left should understand terrorism um, as opposed to uh, decolonization or revolutionary struggle. Right. Those are different things, right? Terrorism is its own thing. And also what uh, I think, I'm going to tell you what I think the left's response to terrorism ought to be generally. And mm. then you can, which is going to be just such, you know, milk toast liberal stuff, you know, like got to demand civil liberties for the people who are accused of what's terrorism. In my, and What's in my book, right? So what's in my book is the Afghanistan article. And I mm. cite Adolf Reed, who mm. was like, you know, 9-11 should be treated as a criminal act and not a war on terror. Yeah, right? that's, where, that's how... These, these people should be arrested and tried. And I think Tarek Ali had that perspective as well. Like, why did they kill Osama bin Laden? Why didn't they bring him back to stand trial? Well, that's a good fucking question. You know, Is it? actually, I think so. Because I think if they brought them back to stand trial, the the intricacies of the international intelligence community would have been put at risk. That's why they couldn't do it. Right. Right. And that's the only reason why Tarek Ali and maybe even Adolf would want that. But that's right. why it was never going to happen. In other words, like the police take extra legal action when it suits them. Right. And so, right. So ostensibly they're right. supposed to follow this it, and that. But, but, but the left the can end, make it suit them less often. Oh, no, 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 I know. But the left is in no position to demand that. And also, why would, you know, like, in other words, does it benefit the left, actually, to show how international Islamic terrorism is actually supported by the metropolitan capitalist countries? Maybe. I mean, well, what does it translate into? In other words, does that how does that advance the goal of socialism? I mean, I guess it delegitimizes the ruling class, but we know from more recent history what has come from the delegitimation of the ruling class, which is Trumpism and QAnon and all right and wow, Curtis yeah, okay. and all I that. I can shit. tell you, okay, let's okay. let's talk about all this in the in all the right. parrot room. Yeah. Um, because I think I can answer that in a way. I mean, yeah, all right. So uh, everyone join us over in the parrot room to talk about the conspiracy that is capitalism.
If you enjoyed this conversation, please do consider supporting us on Patreon. Our patrons help to make sure that Sublation Media can continue to provide interviews, videos, books, and articles that are critical of the left from the left. If you are tired of remaining stuck within bourgeois ideologies and politics, help us sublate them both. <laughs>